to today's RSpec Club. So um, we didn't have anything planned for today, but uh, some big news, I guess, for us dropped yesterday, um, which is there's a new version of ggplot2 coming. Um, as many of you know, we use ggplot2 for making a lot of different types of visualizations. Um, and um, they announced that they're going to have a series of blog posts explaining all the new features in ggplot2. Um, um, and so it sounds like this is a, a pretty major um, change to, to the ggplot2 system. Um, and I thought it'd be good for us to go over the first blog post today. Um, in, in a nutshell, what this uh, version introduces is the ability to have um, gradients on the axis um, and different patterns. So some of these plots that we see over here. Um, um, that's like the a nutshell about it. There's a lot more details. So I'll go over it in detail uh, today. Now, it says that they've um, submitted it to CRAN, this new version. Uh, but right now, if you, if you try to install it from CRAN, you actually get version 3.4.4. So you get the older version. Um, so you, if you want to install the new version, you have to go to GitHub um, to install it that way. Um, 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 and so we look at, on GitHub at the description file for ggplot2. The version that we can get from GitHub is 3.5.0 plus uh, 9,000. 9, um, um, and if you want to install the version from GitHub, um, uh, uh, there's a few ways you could do it. Um, uh, you could use pack, or you could use remote, uh, the remote package with the install underscore GitHub function. In any case, you need to provide the location, which is tidyverse forward slash ggplot2. Um, so that's the version I have currently installed um, right now on my computer, and we'll 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 see if this if these things work. So I'll be copying some of the code that we see there on the blog post and try to run it myself. Um, so you can see that's the version I have of ggplot2. So what the first thing they talk about is um, that they remade the guides. Um, and so what is a guide in ggplot2? Um, um, so, um, um, ooh, mm, we had a little blip here in the room. Um, in any case, um, guides are what the um, axes of legends are made of um, in ggplot2. Um, and um, I didn't know this, but it was still like one of the last things that was built using um, the S3 R class system. Um, and it wasn't using what they built for ggplot2, which is the ggproto system. Um, and so they, they remade the guides, they made them compatible with ggproto. And so that means that now you can actually write packages um, or functions. I mean, functions, and then you put those functions to packages for customizing guides if you want to. So again, that's customizing access and, le and legends. Um, so they added a section about this um, on the extended ggplot2 documentation. So this is like if you want to create a new guide, um, uh, um, you have some. Uh, information here about basically use the ggproto function. You say you're making a guide, and like then you have to um, do a lot more details about exactly how that guide is going to work. I didn't get to read this in detail before now, um, and um, but um, we'll leave that information for later if any of you are interested in making your own guides. So that was one change that is uh, pretty significant because. Um, We'll, we'll probably see in the future packages that have functions that rewrite guides, right? That extend them. Um, um, and so they can access and legends. Um, so we, we might see different types of plots um, there in the future. Another change it did is um, uh, 
is related to patterns and gradients. Um, um, and so they tell us that in a few R versions of the Go, right now we're in R version 4.3.x. So, um, and as we know, R versions get updated once per year around in April. Um, so basically around two to three years ago, um, nearly three years ago, um, they added support for different patterns and gradients in ggplot2. Um, uh, now, this the ability to actually see gradients and patterns depends on your graphical device. Uh, so this is something that, in general, we don't think about. Uh, but likely, when you're working at JHPC, you're using, a, you're using a different graphical device than the one you use on your computer, on your laptop. Um, so um, a lot of times on JHPC, we might even be using the Cairo PNG device, um, or you might be using a different one on, on your laptop. Now, uh, Windows machines, this is important to note, um, um, you actually have to go and change the default graphical device from PNG to either um, the RAG package or the Cairo PNG device. Otherwise, you won't be able to see these, these patterns. Um, 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 and like also like if you're using X11 uh, forwarding, um, sometimes that that might be using a different graphical device. Um, if you're like plotting um, plots on um, at JHPC, um, um, and so sometimes if you're using X11 you might see a different plot from what the plot that you get when you save it to a PDF file or a PNG uh, file. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this, this, all of this has to do with the different um, graphical devices that are used. So that's just a bit of background. It has nothing really to do with ggplot per se, except that um, these gradients um, and patterns, you won't be able to see them if you don't have the right graphical device. So assuming you do have it, um, let's... Try to replicate this plot over here. Um, so uh, we can use this linear gradient function um, that um, basically says like what are the colors we're going to use and some information about like where it starts, where it ends, the units, etc. Um, um, and so this creates an object from the grid package. Um, um, right. um, and uh, what they did now in this new version of ggplot2 is that you can pass that object to the field option um, in ggplot2. Um, so here we have, you know, um, a, a fairly simple um, plot with the MPG data set. We're going to display the this um, displacement variable against the highway one points, and we're saying like, okay, we want a theme background where the field is this gradient. So let's see if this works. And I didn't want to do that. Um, yeah, so it did work on this um, my computer um, using the new version of ggplot2. And so we get this gradient where we have a dark gray on the bottom left corner on the um, um, smallest value on the x-axis, smallest value on the y. And um, um, uh, if we stay, for example, here on this first column, we can see that the colors get lighter as we increase the y-axis. Same thing if we look at the bottom row, the colors get lighter, we increase the x-axis value. If we increase both of them, they also get lighter. So like the lightest point is on the top right corner. Um, this is just the, an example of how you would use this new gradient plot. It's not you know, showing you maybe something that um, we couldn't see before or in terms of plots uh, of points and, and like information that you derive from this plot. But um, I can imagine that there's going to be some creative scenarios where showing gradients uh, is actually informative. Um, so that's that's a uh, like a simple example over here. Um, 
So this linear gradient function is a new one. Um, um, sorry, is it a new one? Actually, it might not be. Um, I think it's from the grid package. Um, yeah, it's from grid. Um, so from grid, we can see the, the, the linear gradient function, radial gradient, pattern functions. So any of those, they create these objects that we can now pass on to the field argument in uh, ggplot2. Um, now, um, they have a few more examples here using linear gradient, radial gradient, and pattern. All of these were grid functions. Um, um, and so the idea is like, um, um, you can decide, for example, in a bar plot, if you want each of those bar plots to have its own gradient or you want them all to be grouped or not. So that's the, this group argument that we see over here. And so we'll see an example where we have them ungrouped versus grouped. Um, um, so we're gonna make two plots um, uh, where we're gonna specify here that we want our fill argument for this bar plot to be um, the output of linear gradient from the grid package. Um, and we have just the two versions, grouped and ungrouped. So let me run that over here. I guess it closed it. Um, so now we can see how uh, on the ungrouped version, um, the pattern is um, independent for every bar, right? Um, whereas on the group gradient, we have the pattern like spanning all of the bar plots, all of the bars. Um, so um, that's just different scenarios of how you control things. Um, I also noticed that like for four, six, and eight, the bar uh, um, you know, goes from dark blue uh, on the y-axis close to zero versus uh, you know yellow on the high values on the y-axis. Whereas this one over here, uh, it's just like across the x-axis. Maybe it's because it has only a, a single y-axis value um, at that point. Um, that could be what's happening there. Um, yeah, so they also got that output over here. Um, so that's just explaining like the, the the group argument from the linear gradient function and how that is reflected on uh, ggplot2. Now, um, um, uh, if we use the scale field manual function, um, so that already existed before, uh, but now we can specify um, a list of patterns. Um, um, and uh, by doing this, is you know before we scale field manually, you, you can pass like a vector of, value, of color values, right? Now you can pass a, a list uh, of um, patterns where the length of the list has to match the um, um, the length of, uh, in this case, for example, bars that we're showing. So in this example over here, we're going to use linear gradient which is the function we've been using before. We'd, um, we're gonna use the ungroup version, so group false. Um, then we're gonna have a color here, um, a single color. Um, and so this is an example of how you can mix single colors with gradient colors if you want to. Then we're gonna test the, grade, the radial gradient function, um, which we haven't used before. This one is from the grid package, as well as the pattern function from the grid package. Um, um, and so uh, we won't get into the details of, of these other functions. Um, but as you can see now, uh, here we're saying like, okay, the feel for our um, our ggplot2 is going to be this uh, uh, cylinder variable. We're going to uh, use geom bar, but then we're going to control the different colors with scale field manual, where we specify to the values this list object that we have created above the patterns list object. Um, um, before we would we would only be able to specify like a vector of um, of uh, colors. Um, so let's put that over here. I 
And so this is the end result here where we uh, have our linear gradient ungrouped on the first bar, our static color on the second bar, our radial gradient on the third bar, um, which looks like an eye of Sauron, but in green type of thing <laughs> in its own tower. Um, and then the last one, which is this um, uh, pattern that we made where we wanted like a green square followed by a black square. Um, um, and it's just, uh, because it has this extend equals repeat, it's just like uh, extended until it covers the full, the full bar. Um, um, so that, that that was the pattern there. Um, so now you can make like, you know, plots like that look like that. Um, and so the next part of the blog post explained to us that one of the challenges that it had when uh, changing to use these functions um, was um, how to handle alpha. So alpha blending, right? That's when we um, um, reduce the, um, the intensity of the color, uh, such that you need like, um, uh, let's say we use alpha 0.5, you need at that point um, two points to fully over, to overlap in order to get full saturation of the color, right? Um, and so, ggplot2 in general uses the scales package for alpha blending. The scales package has this alpha function. But that didn't work for, for this scenario. So they had to write their own function now, which is fill underscore alpha. Right? Um, 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 and uh, so this is one a, a new function that didn't exist before in ggplot2. Um, and it, it only really applies for these fill scenarios. Uh, for you using these, these patterns. Um, and so the idea is that um, instead of using, like passing to the field argument, an alpha for whatever field you have with the alpha blending body that you want, instead in that scenario, you should use the field underscore alpha function. Um, and that, that will work. Um, Abby, you, you wanted to like, um, uh, you know, write functions, et cetera, um, you probably might want to use a new, um, maybe maybe it already existed, but this check underscore device function that allows you to check like, hey, if I want to have patterns and I want to test it, does it actually work or not, this graphical device for that? Um, otherwise, you, you get warning errors like this or error messages that say like, nope, doesn't, it doesn't, you know, support. Um, a particular feature. So that's just for like developers a bit, um, which, you know, maybe you, some of you here might be developing functions um, uh, later. Um, so that was, that's a change there for handling alpha blending. So I don't think they have an example. So let's try to come up with our own example from uh, the plots above. Um, So, I mean, now you can see, right? I, I, I just made it the background alpha blended to uh, one fifth. Um, and so now, like that gray, gray background is, looks a lot lighter. It still has the same patterns, right? Where like the top right corner is the lightest value. Um, so it, it worked you know, out of the box. Um, cool. Um, so the. Um, that's basically the changes related to patterns that they introduced in this blog post. <clears throat> the next change, which I think is maybe quite relevant for some of our spatial work um, um, or other plots, is this next one. Um, so I don't know if you've used the I function before. Um, um, and so they, they change how some of these works. Um, and basically, um, um, uh, let's say here we create a vector, 
um, we're going to set a, a random seed for it. I'm going to create a vector that has the values red, green, and blue. Um, now, um, um, I'm going to copy this code. And instead of using red and green, let's just change the colors a little bit. Um, so I want to use uh, orange. Um, so I'm going to create my vector over here. Um, um, my colors has 234 values, and it has all these. Um, there's a character vector with all, only colored names, really, inside of it. Uh, well, you'll notice that the length of it was set to the same um, among number of points that we have in the MPG data set. Um, and so um, you have a vector like that, which is not part of the data frame that you're plotting for ggplot, right? Um, um, you could uh, directly use it with um, um, uh, a, uh, by specifying the static here that the color is my colors. Um, so I'll try to use that over here. Um, if I do that, right, lines 52 and 53, um, you'll notice that even though I said like, hey, um, I want the colors to come from this variable, my colors, right? It actually then specifies um, other colors for it. Like my, you know, blue became red, orange became green, purple became blue, right? Um, and so, um, one way of dealing with that is with the scale color identity function. So line 54. If we do that, then um, now we're saying like, hey, you know, the colors are in that variable called my colors, but also the values of that vector are actual value color values. So please use those. Um, and so that's what this function does over here, right? Um, uh, boom. Um, and so uh, behind the scenes, um, uh, this is using the i function. Um, now, the issue here is um, that um, at that point, your, the scale color identity is an actual scale, right? So you say, like, these identity scales are true scales. Um, so that means now, um, uh, if you have map colors, um, um, uh, and you have also, so basically like a column of your data frame that you're mapping to the color aesthetic, but then you also have your vector with colors, and you want to combine them, you can't really do that anymore. Um, and so let's look at this this piece of code over here. And like. Let's run different scenarios of it. So let's, for example, uh, display the, uh, the highway variable against uh, the DIS DISPL um, with um, shape one, which means it's a circle that is empty. And we're increasing the point size to five, right? So it looks pretty big. Um, so we can see here that uh, four is red, um, F is green, R is blue, right? Um, so that was lines 57 and 58. Now let's try to say like, hey, um, also I wanna use the vector of my colors. Um, so we do that over here, right? Um, now we're saying um, we use the map value to, to plot the big points, right? With, uh, with shape equals one, size equals five. And so that's again, red is four, uh, sorry, four is red, uh, F is green, R is, um, these are the color, uh, pink. 
Um, but then um, the colors here of blue, orange, and purple that we have under my color, they became this other set of colors, right? Um, like an orange, a light blue, and a, a darker blue. Um, and that's not what we wanted, right? We wanted them to be the actual uh, points themselves. So then you would say like, hey, let's use uh, scale color identity. Uh, but at that point, it doesn't work. And that's because now you have um, um, uh, this vector over here of my colors that you're trying to map, um, trying to use it with a scale color identity. But we have actually two, um, two types of scales, right? We have four points for color. We have the one that we define in line 58, the one we define in line 59. So they're not compatible with one another. And you're going to get this weird error. That if you look at it, you say, like, on color, unknown color name F, right? Does anyone know where that F came from? Or like this error message? This is not the original so, uh, drive values. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, KJ. It came from drive values, right? We had uh, four F and R. So um, four is actually a valid color uh, value. Uh, and that's based on like the, the par colors. F is the one that is the first one that isn't. So that's why, and like blue was was also a valid color. So that's why like the first error that we get is for F, which is not an actual color value. Uh, but if you look at this, you're like, hey, unknown color value name, unknown color name F, you're like, that's a weird error message. Where did that come from, right? Um, so that's where it came from. So um, the solution to this scenario is to use the I function. So they, they change a bit how it works, et cetera. Um, and so 62 is exactly the same as 57. Um, 63 is exactly the same as 58. The change comes in uh, line 64 versus 59, right? Um, where we are now using the I function to our vector, my colors. And so we use that. Now, we get, um, oops, now we get the scenario that we wanted, which is the, the drive uh, column of our data frame that has the values 4, F, and R is mapped to uh, red, green, and blue. That's the big circles that we have. But then our other vector called my colors is the one that is mapped to the, um, uh, to the small, like dark, the small field points. Um, and so the reason why I changed also the colors for doing this example was compared to the blog post, is the blog post is using red, green, and blue for the outer um, points as well as the inner points. And I, th I thought it was a bit confusing to follow through, right, and understand um, which values were, used, were being used where, right? Because when I first looked at this, I was like, oh, are the dry values used for both the internal point and the external point? And then I realized, no, that's not the case. Um, and so the reason why I'm saying this could be maybe useful for um, a spatial transcriptomics um, is you can imagine now um, controlling the, um, an outer uh, color of a point with one variable. Let's say, for example, um, uh, you know, your spatial clusters, and then the inner color with a different color, let's say, um, what was the most dominant cell type present in that in that spot, things like that, right? So you can imagine doing this type of, uh, of visualizations later on. Um, anyway, um, uh, um, now, uh, Um, now, 
um, this part of the blog post now says since um, they change right how they deal with um, axes and legends, right? The um, this change that they made to the I function and, and it's used for it uh, also now applies to the X and, and Y axis. So we didn't have these functions before. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, for um, or the x-axis or the y-axis, um, and I, I don't think they have them. Let me check. Yeah, so there's no scale x identity or scale y identity functions. Um, so here they have a, a more complicated example where you have to use the i function. Um, and so um, first they define like a sequence of values following pi. Then they say like, okay, let's display this with uh, color gray 50, but they're gonna annotate with a rectangle. Um, um, and they're gonna use this on the x and y. Um, values for that um, for that rectangle. So we're gonna add a red rectangle. Um, this is the one over here that we see that goes from the first 5% on the x-axis to the 95% uh, on the x-axis. Same thing for the y. Then um, you can also annotate in blue this uh, like um, basically like this um, um, uh, ellipsis, um, and then we could also annotate with like adding some text and saying, hey, we want the text to be at, in the middle. And so uh, we need to use this I function to specify these coordinates, right, which are like numerical vectors that we are constructing um, that are not part of the data frame uh, that um, we use for plotting. Um, in order to then control exactly where we want to, uh, our uh, annotations to pop up. Um, so um, uh, that, you know, in the end, um, um, I don't have a, a use case in mind exactly, but like, I guess if you want to add maybe, you know, sometimes we have the correlation value or things like that, some plots, this is where maybe you use that I function. Um, cool. Another change they made was they tried to simplify the units for geom text and geom label. Um, and um, they did this by adding a new argument called the size unit argument. And that's because these functions, um, they use different units by default. So geom text um, uses a different unit than geom label. And now you want to make sure that you know what unit you're using. You can specify the size unit argument that you couldn't use before. Um, that way you can maybe, uh, uh, so without changing the defaults of what unit each of these functions uses, now you have a bit more control, right? So you don't have to do the conversion yourself. The functions will do the conversion between the different units, between text size um, units in points versus text size in millimeters. Um, um, so this just makes it a little bit, um, you know, simplifies a little bit your, your experience as a user, um, such that now you know like you know, this element size over here, that was 10, that was a, a point size value. Geom text before, I think the default is uh, was millimeters. And now you can say like, hey, I actually wanna use 10, but also uh, on a point size scale. Um, uh, um, and so there's an example here with geom label. Um, uh, um, um, another change that they made also to geom label was they added an angle or aesthetic. Um, this didn't exist before, but now you can have angles to your labels. Um, so you get a plot that looks like this if you want to, where you change the, the, the angles. Um, um, 
Um, they also added this uh, label padding argument, such that you want to add like some padding on your text on the left side, right side, etc. You can do that now. So here they have an example where to every text label they add a little a little padding to the right. Um, uh, I can't imagine a scenario where you want that because then you have more stuff that can block out points on the back column. Uh, but I guess there the, the could be a scenario where maybe you want to have some of that padding. Um, so yeah, with label padding now you can do it like you can specify the margins, etc. cetera, where, where you want that, that padding to, to be. Um, um, so I can't imagine a scenario where we I will be using that right now, but maybe there will be. The next change, though, I can definitely uh, see where we want to use this, and that's because um, um, on geom density, um, um, they made a change before that you can now specify you can specify the bounds of the geom density. The same thing happened now. Uh, they introduced this change now to geom violin. And this is important because um, when you're estimating a density function, right? Um, um, let's say uh, we have the density on the y-axis. Um, but let's say we only have values. I want to put ticks where we have values, right? Um, You plot the density, it would look like, oh, there's nothing. There's maybe something here, two there, one there, nothing. But it continues, right? This, um, the, the density line continues for a while, even though maybe you don't have any more values. Um, and so this is like very common when you're working with percents. Um, um, where, um, where you have uh, some percent values or proportion values, they're, they're bounded by zero to one, right? So a lot of times when you made like a density plot or not or a violin plot, um, the violin would go, would go beyond uh, possible values. And then you will show the plot to other people and they would be like, why, are you, why do you have values that are beyond what is possible, right? So then this is where you want to use that balance argument. Um, and the fact that GM violin now supports that balance argument is pretty, uh, I think, can, um, will be definitely, um, I can definitely think of scenarios where this will be useful. Um, um, so that's another change that I introduced. Um, um, now, another one that uh, we've probably all dealt with is uh, GM box plot. As, um will by default uh, plot the outliers. But let's say you want to use a geom point on top of it to jitter the points. By default, we had to use um, outlier shape equals MA to hide the outliers. Um, uh, and so now they, they made it a little bit easier to do this. So now you can use outliers equals false if you want to on geom box plot instead of uh, so that's a more intuitive change instead of saying like, oh, the shape has to be in a, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to hide the outliers. Um, so I think that that makes it a bit easier. Um, um, and then the staple width argument, I guess, um, um, is um, they added, I guess, the little bars at the end over here. Um, And I guess they're saying, like, if you set it to zero, then you, you would get the same box plus that you got before, which is your plot two, that didn't have those, those little bars. Um, so um, just in case you notice that your plots look different. Um, they also try to improve error messages. Um, and all of this is done with um, the CLI package. and. Um, just making you know errors a bit more informative. So uh, this is just one the first blog post. I don't know how many of them they're going to have introducing the changes to ggplot 3.5.0. But as you can see, it took like a, a large village of people 
and everyone that contributed changes to, to ggplot2, uh, including the creator of ggplot2, Hadley. Uh, Hadley, we Oh, like uh, I see, I noticed there are web pages there, right? He's uh, part of the Bioconnect core team um, and other people. Um, so some of them are employees from our studio, or I mean, um, Posit, um, um, like him, him um, and some other people are like um, just users of it. Like, you know, it could be you the next time. If you find an error a book, you make a, a GitHub issue about it. In this new improvements are compatible with previous version or? Um, you might need to change code. Yeah. 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 Oh, so that's also why we, we need to be aware of it. Right? Yeah. Oh. Um, okay. That's it. For uh, I wanted to say, I think one thing that's really great about this release with the ability to do patterns on plots is this can help us make plots more colorblind friendly, which a lot of journals are really emphasizing now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I hope you have fun with the package. Um, um, and we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, you see error, some of these error messages, right? Now you'll know where they came from. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, I also think in you know, a Lux, maybe, uh, some creative options for our plots that uh, we maybe didn't know we needed. Cool. All right. So that's it for today. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much. See you.